Yeah. So the way we'll go about this, we'll have first um, a couple of personal questions to Daniel and then um, more time for substantive question about EA, about nuclear security, about how EA plays out in Sub-Saharan Africa, etc. And there will be, so first, this will be a bit of a fireside chat. I'll ask some questions, but then we'll just give questions to all of us after some time. And it's a real privilege that you're taking this time, Daniel, because like, you know, from your profile, I see that you're really busy, like doing many things. Yeah, so Daniel is pursuing a career in nuclear security. He's an executive board member of the international student Young Pukwash and member of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And I think I'll ask you then yourself if you could tell us a bit more about your professional profile in a second, because, you know, going from LinkedIn, it's so big um, that it's really hard to, like, you know, understand everything. But maybe to, at the very start, I, it would be very nice if you could tell us some personal things like, what kind of family do you come from? Do you have siblings? Which part of Nigeria Nigeria are you from? Okay. Thank you so much, Dominic. I'm so glad to be here to engage in this discussion and I'm glad to see everyone today. I think here for Christians has been a huge light to me and I'm very glad to engage in the community. Um, as we all know, I'm Daniel Ajidonu and uh, I come from Delta States, Nigeria that's located in the south, southern part of Nigeria, but I'm currently based in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, yeah, I have a family, I have my parents, I have my siblings. Interestingly, I have about six siblings, beautiful siblings, and uh, they are wonderful. Yeah, and uh, currently, as we all know, I work in nuclear security, specifically with ISYP currently, International Student Young Progress. And previously, I was a Deputy Partnerships Coordinator at Youth for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. At ISYP, it's, we, we are keen on reducing the risk at the interface of science, technology, society, and ethics. It's a specific focus on weapons of mass destruction. And it's very interesting that we are looking into programming activities in Africa. Conventionally, ISYP has been focused on the West and that, but we are looking into some programming activities in Africa in order to encourage talents with this idea possibly field. And, uh, I'll, I'm also looking forward to some uh, nuclear security fuel building in EA, and I really hope that that could get off the ground soon. Thank you so much. Okay. And so just to get the basics, like what, what did you study bef like to make you, that brought you to nuclear security? What's your field of study? Thank you. I have a background in economics and uh, very interesting. I currently in my final semester of undergraduate studies at the University of Benin. Um, I've always been passionate about solving the world's most pressing issues. And I started from solving youth unemployment issues in Nigeria, where I founded a Youth Times Initiative, where we focused on rights and publishing articles centered on youth development issues. Along the line, I went kind of above the trajectory to Africa and worked in international action Africa and uh here am I in nuclear security you know one striking thing about my trajectory is that working on local issues you know got me more intrigued about continental issues which led me to more globally focused issues and that, that's why I'm currently in nuclear security and I'm very keen on seeing how we can get to a world that is free of nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thanks. And and so can can I ask a bit about your 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 church background and your faith. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious like um what what kind of church um is important to you or or do you go to and what kind of people have shaped your faith? the most and yeah also like what kind of spiritual experiences are important to you thank you very much That's big so questions really... and don't oh, yeah. feel, feel obliged to skip any questions that yeah. are a bit like too straightforward yeah sure that's that is very okay 
And uh, please, if I don't get to answer all the questions, could you kind of remind me so that I get back to them, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, um, I am a Christian and uh, I am an Anglican currently, but I am very, I, I am a firm believer in the priesthood of all believers. So beyond uh, being an Anglican, you know, I am very passionate about the ecclesia in itself, the body of Christ. You know, denomination does not define Christianity. It's our experience and our belief in Christ Jesus. The death, crucifixion, or resurrection of Jesus Christ, I think that's what defines Christian, basically, and that's what I'm passionate about. And, uh, you know, there is one key person that has shaped my Christianity, not just spiritually, but in all ramifications, I, 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 I would say. And it's so sad that I didn't get to meet him before he passed on, you know, that is uh, the Dr. Miles Moreau of Blessed Memories, you know, he's a great man, someone that I treasure and I value so much. And he's kind of a mentor to me, even in his grade, you know, one word that he put out there some time ago is that beyond character, there's no longevity. And that has been an inspiration for me coming from Africa, where things may seem really hard, but you just need to strive, you know, to achieve your goals and desire as an individual. And uh, I found Christ in the year 2018. I think that was April 2018, not too long ago. I had always been a church goer. I, I come from a Christian background. You know, my parents are pastors, right? My dad is a priest in the Anglican church. And uh, so I have, I have a very strong Christian background. But I was just a church goer, you know, because my parents are pushing me to church. But in 2018, at a conference uh, on the administration of, uh, I can't remember his name now. I can't remember his, his name, so sad, you know. I actually found Christ at that event, you know. It was more of, um, you need to stop deceiving yourself. You need to stop pretending, you know. It is what it is, you know. If you want to follow Christ, you follow Christ. If you are not, then that is it. But then I started to give my life to Christ. And since then, I've been, I've been very active in the church, you know. At my university, I serve on the chapel committee. Uh, I also served as the brothers coordinator of the youth fellowship twice, and I've been involved in a whole lot of church activities. So I'm passionate about advancing the kingdom of God, even beyond the spiritual aspect. How do we, you know, um, ensure that you know the kingdom of Christ is brought here on earth? Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Yeah, but I apologize for the mess bit in my own background. I told yeah. my son so firmly he shouldn't interrupt me because I'm easily interrupted. I can't do two things and he just didn't follow my orders. So I had to, um, yeah. So yeah, thanks for that. So yeah, going a bit from, from church to, to effective altruism, can you tell, tell us a bit about how effective altruism feels like in Nigeria? So kind of, is it big? What, what backgrounds do people in effective altruism come from? Are they more students or what kind of, people and what are the causes that they're interested in okay. from your impression thank you um you know i'd like to establish that um the growing population of young people in nigeria are passionate about changing the country for good they are passionate about walking for the future of nigeria and they are passionate about reaching for our dreams nigeria is a blessed country africa is blessed Nigeria is one of the few countries with almost all natural resources that you can think of. But the question remains how we have maximized these resources. And the young people are curious about the fact that we have so much at our disposal, but look at where we are. How can we maximize them? So young people are taking, you know, um, they're taking action to ensure that we reach where we reach our dreams in Nigeria and Africa at large. And uh, within EA in Nigeria, um, I, I think that it's quite a difficult, you know, to, you know, that there needs to be increased publicity, you know, around EA in Nigeria, because, you know, you know, people are curious about how can I do it, but you know, not everyone, you know, know about the, you know, mechanisms and, you know, organizations that are there to help them maximize that dream and that desire. So um, currently, the eight Nigeria spans just about uh, over, over 30 members, right? And uh, the student community is quite, uh, is quite more. And we have, you know, just uh, very, and we have 
few people who are working. And it's, I would say, it's also made up of very young people. So we don't have very advanced you know, people who are advanced in age within the community. So people that are very young and, uh, you know, students more currently. And we, I, am, I am actually looking forward to, you know, a community where we can have uh, even more professionals in industry and techni technocrats who can, you know, take, you know, this message of altruistic, you know, mindsets forward. Thank you very much. Okay. So, so that's what you're looking forward to. And, and it, if you want, if you would want to say like, what's the biggest strength of, of having effective altruists in Nigeria, not just Nigeria, I mean, maybe other, um, other West African or um, Sub-Saharan African countries, what, what's, what's the distinctive contribution that you think can be made by, by people from, from background in these countries? Thank you very much. I think that the number one result of them, um, okay, let me mention this. Someone once said, poverty breeds two things, either a criminal or a revolutionist, right? You know, these are two things that poverty can bring. You know, um, the, the first biggest strength that, you know, um, a strong EA community in Nigerian Africa at large can bring is a more strong and formidable, and formidable community of people who are not just willing to change the world, but willing to do everything it takes to change the world. However, within the context of what is right, and what is good for the future of humanity, right? Um, I would like to say that um, Africa as a country, or rather Africa as a continent, over the, over the end of this, of, between now and the end of the century, Africa is predicted to have the largest population in the world, over 2 point something billion people. And it's very interesting that to note that majority of the African you know, population are young people. I think, for example, Nigeria. Nigeria is currently made up of over 200 million people, and over 60 to 70 percent of the population is made up of young people between the ages of 18 and 35. However, majority of these young people are currently unemployed. It's not about the fact that they don't have the skills or the desire to um, maximize their potential, but there is not there is not that opportunity for them to do that. So, um, focusing specifically on your question, a very strong EA community in Africa. I am very sorry to say that it may well begin from increased capacity building on core areas that are critical. You know for the future of humanity. But I am also op optimistic that uh, no matter how little, no matter how small the group of professionals we have, maybe I think that within their little uh, environment with their little effort, they could create some form of good and advanced courses. But I think it's really dependent on how well we are able to maximize the growing population of young people who do not either possess the skills or are currently dormant, not doing good. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So I, I mean, I see one thing. It's just there. Are, there are so many people and so many young people. And you say, yeah, and people growing up in challenging circumstances. So if there's unemployment or poverty, this can create criminals or revolutionaries. So kind of less complacency in that sense. I, I don't know. And maybe a very similar question, but. Um, how to say so one is like yeah what's distinctive about EA in Nigeria and what could be you know what could they do that was like a question I asked and what could the global EA movement learn from Nigerian effective altruists so what, what are some mindsets or some practices or some life experiences that the people in Africa or um, in Nigeria bring with them that you think others are lacking and that would actually be very helpful? Thank you very much for that question. And that's a very difficult question because, <laughs> you know, I am, a, I actually value and cherish the Nigerian populace, the Nigerian community. And uh, 
I think that currently within the EA space in Nigeria, um, it may not be very advantageous to focus on what we can offer because oftentimes, or rather, I think now we need to focus on building our capacity. We do not have much people who have that strength to um, carry in as much as they would desire. So I personally, I think that is lacking. I have, I have the opportunity to, um, to engage with you know, people and uh, I think that capacity is lacking. You know, I, I think that capacity is lacking. I, I, I think that that is in Danny currently. And uh, yeah, I think that is what I can say on that. Maybe if you're going to the q and section, section, I may be able to shed more light on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um... But also, yeah, sorry, mm. sorry to question. I would also love to add that um, uh, we, we also have some people who think that they can do good or who are optimistic about their own potentials. Like I have met young people, students in Nigeria, who are passionate about being good, but some of them are, are some of them that I have met, you know, I, I met one who does graphic designing, you know, but at the same time, he also does photography, you know, because he needs to make ends meet. And at the same time, he's passionate about pushing an impactful career. And come on, you know, so, you know, then how does he, you know, it's now like uh, he was, one was asking me, how do I, how do I engage in EA mm -hmm. and I am able to meet all the needs? That was what someone was asking me, you know, that's a very sensitive question. And I am very sorry to say that. Um, that is very, um, that is very popular to some extent in the EA community. I am not saying the Nigerian community at large, but, you know, that is kind of popular. And I think it's something that needs to be worked in, you know, largely. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I can ask also the question like in a very negative way, but what, what do you find is lacking in effective altruists coming from the uh, from highly developed countries of the global north? I mean, I, this is deliberately provocative, and feel free to skip the question. But do you find anything that that you wished for and that that you see lacking? To I mean, to push you a bit, but feel free to skip it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, uh, one thing that I, over the years, I have engaged largely with, you know, working remotely and working with colleagues from the West. Mm -hmm. I have come to understand that individuals are different. We have different backgrounds. We have different cognitions and we have different forms of reasoning. And, uh, you know, this sometimes affects our outlook and our behavior. So I think that generally the EA, the EA community, uh, you know, in the Western Europe, et cetera, I think uh, it's been able to kind of manage their interaction with the global South, Nigeria and Africa. So I wouldn't say that much is lacking. I would also encourage that, um, you know, um, people should, or there should be um, less perception of Africa as, uh, a risk for malevolent actors, right? I, you know, I have had this, you know, certain things, but I understand. But it's also what nothing that every all over the world there are malevolent actors. And come come to think of it, you know, we have only had, take for example in Nigeria, we've had more organized crimes than single um crimes by terrorists and the likes, right? So, I think that you know, um, that is one thing that needs to be improved on. And I also think that there should be more, um, there should be this safe space for people who don't even have any idea about EA. So when they come into the, this space, you know, they should feel that, you know, they, they should feel that despite the fact that I, I, I don't know much, I can actually offer something I have value, right? That is one risk that things to play out when people from, you know, from the global south can interact with people from the global north, yeah. Yeah, thanks for like engaging uh yeah so intensely with all the questions and so 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 one one very interesting thing is that if you're from Nigeria, you're from a place where religion plays a much bigger role. 
So I'm from Europe and I'm in effective altruism and I work in philosophy. So I'm in one of the most secular bubbles um, of, the, of the world. And then even if I speak with Americans, I realize, you know, it's already a, a context where religion is taken more for granted. And I think in Nigeria, it's even much more so uh, it, like that religion is everywhere and it's, and it's respected. So, yeah, how do you feel about that when you engage with effective altruism? There are many people are secular. Um, how, how do you feel that the, the Christian background can add something distinctive to your practice as an effective altruist? Okay, that is a very fantastic question, right? Do you know why? Because I would actually throw a question back, although more of a you know, what's, what's the word, not to get a feedback, but just to ponder upon, right? Um, is it possible to get to a saturation point of wanting to, to do good for any individual? You know, that is a question for I think all EAs. But as a Christian, when you're getting overwhelmed, or when I am getting overwhelmed by the burdens of life, you know, I want to help this person, but you know, I am also feeling all the pressures, I need to meet all the needs, and sometimes I'm like, should I actually do good? You know, I think I can just work for my own interest. I can change my career path, right? I can be going to what to give me some money quickly, right? But something that comes to mind always is that um, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's what comes to mind. Sometimes I think it's very, very um, sensitive and tricky when you're trying to do good, but what is your underlying inspiration and what can keep you going even at your even at the times when you know you are in your deepest you know challenges the book of first corinthians chapter 4 verse 8 you know and comes to mind but i think specifically on the 70 when it says though i am pressed on every side but i am not de- i am not distressed i'm forsaken but not cast down you know that my light affliction which is but for a moment is you know work it out in more eternal and it's in a way of blurring me right those are some things that come to mind but when i engage within the ea community as a christian as a christian christ during his time on earth he was open to everybody the jews and the gentiles and he even rebuked the jews sometimes for trying to discriminate so um i respect everyone's religion i respect ideals and past practices and my underlying motivation for being an ea is to do good and how can i support others to do good so I'm a Christian. I'll keep on I'll keep on pursuing my religion and working out my salvation and fear and trembling while you keep doing yes. And when it comes to things, and when it comes to areas of tensions between Christianity and EA, you know that is one thing that could be there. Also, I stand by my faith, right? I stand by my faith. I do not, you know, I do not shift stance on that. I hope that helps with the question. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that, that's really the relation of your faith and, and, and effective altruism. Have you ever felt like a bit hard to say? Uh, on, on a more sociological level, do you always feel welcome as a Christian? Have you sometimes felt out of place or does it feel, um, do, do you feel, is it for you completely natural? Um, to be a Christian in, in such a secular space. Okay, like less on that. like, Go yeah, on. more on the social level. How, how, how is that for you? Okay, thank you very much. You know, first of all, I think that the world is never friendly to anybody, but you need to be able to overcome evil with good. I am not saying that it comes to this, if I'm talking about the world in general. So whenever I approach the world, I, I'm like, you are a sheep going into a space of wolves. So all you have to do is be who you are. You know, right? So it's more like, uh, I think I am kind of very, I, okay, I have a very, very strong um, character and I have a very, very strong, uh, um, what is, what is what actually, I have a very strong perception of who I am. I have an identity. I'm very conscious of my, of my identity wherever I am. So it is very difficult for me to be intimidated, you know, Irrespective of where I am. So within EA, it doesn't occur. Sometimes I see different perspectives in conflict with my own perspective. And what I do, you know, you have your perspective, that is fine. 
know, I think you are living for yourself and your goal. I'm living for myself and my goal, and I'm living for God. So I respect that you can work with that while I am working with my own. You know, I think everyone has their life to live, but what matters is that whatever you are doing, please do good ultimately. Okay. Yeah. And so um, b- before I open yeah, the floor to everyone who, who, who would like to ask questions, I, I, I'm, I'm curious about the nuclear se- security just a bit more. And really, I, I don't know the space very well. And, and I guess it's a space that many of us hear a bit about, but that it's, it's really a space for experts. So, so can you tell us... Um, What's this? Is there? What's this specifically? Uh, the, the perspective by, yeah, from sub-Saharan Africa that you bring to the table that like I wouldn't hear about in my in my local newspaper. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think the first perspective is that we need to denuclearize. We need to get nukes from off our world. They are a huge threat to the future of humanity, to the future of generations to come. I think that is the one of the very cr- critical things. And I think the other would actually be that um, Africa as a continent has, you know, largely been side sidelined from conversations that, you know, are focused on either the global north or the globe in general. But um, I think it's hard to know that people from Africa understand that this world is my home as well. The world is not just for the people from the global north. We all make up the world. The world is getting more integrated day by day. So we must get into that conversation. And uh, I would say that, be you the global, not be the global South, let it be US, let it be Russia. I don't think anyone should have a legal, you know, um, stance to possess a nuclear weapon. And I'll just share a few thoughts on what's going on in Ukraine currently. I think that um, Russia is wrong for invading Ukraine. And I also think that the international community, and I would say the world powers, have you know, not managed the situation as I think it should have been. I think we were at also high thing, you know, on um, parts of threat during the Cold War. And you know, it was recently remembered this past week, right? But I think that you know the president of the United States at the time was able to understand, you know, beyond um his own or beyond the country's own um needs they were able to make concessions for the greater good and they could understand that humanity was at a higher risk and i think that at this point while the international community is doing what they can to move forward i think that you know i would share the views okay i think that russia should be offered some concession that is my own perspective i am assuming that russia should be allowed to take hold of ukraine and I wouldn't say what that concession should look like, but I would say that the West should not think of, let us take out Russia completely. I think Russia is a sovereign state and that should be respected. And how demands sometimes make conflict with what could be for the greater good of others. But I, I think that they need to come to the table. I think that a peace talk should be looked at and it's still possible. But you know, we all need to accept that. Sometimes you just have to make certain sacrifices for the greater good. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that. Yes, I mean, there's a uh, yeah, plenty to talk about here. And yes, yeah, so. And uh, a, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, let me add something quickly before, you know, we start asking questions. I think I'd also like to say that um, we also have quite a number of professionals within EA space and LinkedIn. You know, I know someone, you know, who is currently doing an MBA outside the, the country, and some people have also gotten involved with, you know, some other, you know, good, um, good organizations. But, I think we also need to maximize what they bring to the table. And maybe during the uh, q and section, I can shed more light on that because I, I think that um, the little that we have, we need to maximize it. And the question is, how do we maximize it? Are we ready to maximize it? You know, are, are we ready to make that effort? I think that's where the big question lies, you know, majorly. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. So there, there would be a whole lot of more questions, but I think we'll open it up. And anyone who has questions, please feel free to come in. I'll also stop the recording so we don't have to worry about um, what precisely 
we say um, 